In this video, we're gonna go through all the main types of equity. First off, RSUs. RSUs are claims for shares of company stock given to employees as a form of compensation. RSUs are structured to vest when a certain period of time has passed or when certain milestones have been reached. Unlike stock options, you do not have to pay to exercise RSUs. Once they vest, they're yours and will have some form of value upon vesting unless the company stock becomes completely worthless. Once the RSUs vest, employees receive underlying shares of company stock. They are considered income once vested and a portion of the shares is withheld to pay income taxes. The employee then receives the remaining shares and has the right to sell them. Now, historically, RSUs were far more common for employees of public companies than those who work at private companies. But over the last 20 years, RSUs have become much more common at private companies that have closed large rounds of fund financing at large valuations, typically over $1 billion, when that valuation is not likely to be achieved or justified for a few years. Now, one of the reasons for this increase in popularity was due to the stock options accounting scandals involving companies like Enron and WorldCom in the mid-2000s. You know, many companies started compensating employees with RSUs instead of stock options, potentially to avoid accounting issues, but also because RSUs are just another way to attract and retain talent. All right, stock options. These are a form of compensation that gives an employee the right to buy shares of company stock for a set price at a future date. Stock options are usually issued by private companies that plan to go public at a future date and therefore act as an incentive to remain with the company long term due to vesting requirements and the potential that the company goes public. They are usually awarded as part of the employee's hiring or promotion package. Employer granted stock options can be incentive stock options, ISOs, or non-qualified stock options, NSOs, and their tax treatment varies. In this video, we'll focus just on the incentive stock options and we'll refer to those as ISOs. Now, stock options typically have a vesting schedule that must be satisfied before the employee can exercise the option. In other words, you must stay at the company for a certain period of time before you even have the right to exercise or own these options. Many companies use what's called a one-year cliff schedule with a four-year fully vesting period. This means that you vest 25% of your options granted to you after one year with the company and then the remaining 75% vest over the subsequent three years. After four years, the employee would be fully vested and have the right to exercise 100% of their stock options. If you like this video and wanna see more of our content, hit subscribe right now. We'd really appreciate it. Employee Stock Purchase Plan. Now an ESPP, Employee Stock Purchase Plan, is a company run program in which participating employees can purchase company stock at a discounted price. Employees contribute to the plan through payroll deductions, which build up between the offering date and the purchase date. At the purchase date, the company uses the employee's accumulated funds to purchase stock in the company on behalf of the participating employees. The IRS then limits you to a maximum contribution of $25,000 each year, although your employer may cap your contributions at a lower amount or a percentage of your income. Unlike regular 401k contributions, your ESPP contributions are withheld from after-tax income, similar to how Roth 401k plan contributions work. Once you enroll in the ESPP, your payroll contributions accrue during what's known as the offering period. And your offering period will be broken up into purchase periods, which are generally six months long. At the end of these purchase periods, your employer uses your accumulated contributions to buy shares for you at a discount. So for example, you could have a one-year offering period starting on January 1st, 2022 with two six-month purchase periods, one ending on June 31st, 2022, and the second ending on December 31st, 2022 your shares get purchased on the last day of the purchase period. Now, many plans also have a look back provision, which makes them even more attractive. The look back provision allows you to apply whatever discount your employer offers to the lower of these two numbers. That is the price on the first date of the offering period or the price on the last day of the purchase period. This rule may help increase your benefit if the stock price has gone up during the offer period. A 15% discount on its own is pretty nice, yes, but the ability to apply that discount to the minimum of two prices makes ESPPs even more compelling. For example, say your company begins an offer period for an ESPP with a 15% discount. At the beginning of the offer period, the stock price is $10 per share. And if the price increases to $15 per share on the purchase day, your 15% discount would be applied to the $10 price at the beginning of the offer period meaning your purchase price would be $8.50 per share. So how are RSUs taxed? First with vesting, when you're granted RSUs, you do not have any immediate tax liability as you technically do not own the shares yet. Once your RSUs vest though, this triggers a tax liability and you have to report income based on the fair market value of the stock. 
The value of your vested shares equals the number of shares times the fair market value of those shares. Since stock you receive through RSUs is essentially compensation, you'll usually see it reported automatically on your W-2. In many cases, your employer will withhold a portion of your RSUs as payment for taxes owed at the time of vesting. As with all withholding, the taxes your employer deducts from your paycheck may not be enough to cover the full amount of tax that you owe when you file your tax return. For example, if you have 300 shares vest and they're worth $10 a share, you'll need to pay tax on income of $3,000. Assuming a 30% tax bracket, your tax bill will be $900 or 90 shares. Most companies will sell these 90 shares to cover your tax bill and then transfer the remaining 210 shares to your stock plan brokerage account. You may owe additional taxes at the state level depending on where you live. Now, the second part to taxes on RSUs is on the sale. Now, if your employer is a publicly traded company, you can sell your shares at any time after vesting. And if your employer is a non-public company, you cannot sell your shares in most cases as there is no readily available marketplace. In either case, you'll likely have to pay taxes again if you sell stock you receive through an RSU. After you take ownership and pay the income tax on the fair value of that stock, you treat the stock for taxes the same as if you bought the stock on the open market on the day of vesting. If you sell the stock at a higher price than its fair value at the time of vesting, you'll have a capital gain. If you hold the stock for one year or less, your gain will be short term and you'll owe ordinary income tax on it. If you hold the stock for more than a year, your gain will be long term, meaning you'll pay tax at a more favorable capital gains rate. How are incentive stock options taxed? Incentive stock options are typically only taxed when you sell the stock after exercising. And for normal tax purposes, exercising your options is not a taxable event. You just want to be aware of the alternative minimum tax, which we'll cover in another video. ISOs are only taxed when you sell your stock post exercise. The time frame since your grant date and exercise date will determine your taxes here. So if you sell the stock less than two years after the grant date and one year after the exercise date, this is considered a disqualifying disposition and you're taxed on the difference between the exercise price and sales price at the short term capital gains rate. If you sell the shares for more than two years after the grant date and one year after the exercise date, this is considered a qualifying disposition and you will be taxed on any increase in value over the exercise price of the long-term capital gains rate. Put another way, you are not usually taxed upon exercise, but when you go to sell the stock, any increase in value over the exercise price will be taxed at the long-term capital gains rate as long as you meet both of the following conditions. If you hold the shares for at least two years after they were granted to you, and you hold the shares for at least one year after exercising them. If you do not meet these two conditions, you'll be taxed at the short-term capital gains rate, which is your ordinary income rate, upon the sale of your shares. This is what can make this decision so tricky. Do you exercise and then hold on until you reach that long-term capital gains rate? Or do you just sell right away and diversify your investments while taking the larger tax hit? You're certainly taking less risk and selling right away, but it doesn't always feel great to sell all that company stock. So how is an employee stock purchase plan taxed? When the company buys the shares for you, you do not owe any taxes. You are exercising your rights under the ESPP. Buying the stock is not in itself a taxable event. But when you sell the stock, the discount that you received when you bought that stock is generally considered additional compensation to you. So you have to pay taxes on it as regular income, regardless of how long you held the stock. If you hold the stock for a year or less before you sell it, any gains will be considered ordinary income and taxed as such. If you hold the shares for more than one year, any gains will be taxed at the usually lower capital gains rate. So to understand how the stock is taxed further, you need to understand whether the sale is a qualifying disposition or a disqualifying disposition. A disqualifying disposition means that you sold the stock within two years after the offering date or one year or less from the exercise, the purchase date. In this case, your employer will report the bargain element as compensation on your form W-2. So you will have to pay taxes on that amount as ordinary income. And again, that bargain element is the difference between the exercise price and the market price on the exercise date. Any additional profit is considered capital gains, short-term or long-term, depending on how long you held the shares and will be reported on Schedule D. A qualifying disposition is when you sold the stock for at least, at least two years after the offering or grant date and at least one year after the exercise purchase date. If so, a portion of the profit, that bargain element, is considered compensation income and tax at ordinary income rates on your 1040. Any additional profit is considered long-term capital gains, which is usually taxed at the lower rates than regular income, and therefore it should be reported on Schedule D capital gains and losses. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Tony from Wealthfront. Take care.